everyone, welcome. I'm Ife Taya, the founder of the People of Color Psychedelic Collective. The POC Psychedelic Collective aims to bring psychedelic education to people of color around the world. We're working towards collective healing through our knowledge of psychedelics. This will be the first of many conversations that we're broadcasting virtually. I'm here with my beautiful panelists. Thank you for joining me in this conversation on healing um, with psychedelics for people of color. So please introduce yourselves to our audience. Hi, I'm Lorena Nascimento. I'm from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I moved to Portland, Oregon in 2015 uh, for do grad school in urban studies, where I became more aware of uh, structural injustice for urban, urban population of color. And now I work as a research graduating in graduate environmental justice. Hey everyone, assalamu alaikum and Ramzan Mubarak. Uh, my name is Asad Ramid and I am a software engineering consultant. Um, I, I'm talking to you from the city of Chicago and I grew up uh, in Illinois. Um, and right now I'm excited to join the panel and uh, I'm have been part of the healing effects of this whole thing. So thank you so much. It's an honor. Hi, my name is Daniel Garcia. Uh, I'm an attorney in the state of Colorado, and I live in the beautiful town of Dillon currently. Um, I've known Ife for uh, quite a few years now, and I've been working with her in this group, um, you know, to make psychedelics more accessible and inclusive uh, to all people. Um, greetings, everyone. <laughs> My name is Krupa Patel, and um, I work in community health, and I am based out of Chicago, Illinois, and I'm happy to be part of this panel. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Uh, for our newbies out there, what are the types of psychedelics? How long do the effects last? Tell me about some of the ancient and contemporary uses of psychedelics. Hey, it's Daniel. Um, so there's quite a bit out there nowadays. Uh, you have your classics like uh, LSD, uh, magic mushrooms, otherwise known as uh, psilocybin, um, and MDMA, um, as has become quite popularized lately. Um, but there's also ceremonial uh, psychedelics um, like ayahuasca, peyote, um, ibogaine. Um, ayahuasca and ibogaine have become um, quote unquote more popular and more mainstream recently. Ibogaine for uh, its healing effects and help people get over uh, opioid addiction. And ayahuasca, you know, all the techies have been doing it and um, for the experience, but it's been around for a while and it's um, and uh, has been used by ancient cultures for uh, quite a bit. Um, and then there's also the designer psychedelics, which make things more confusing. Um, and those are the ones that are usually letters and numbers like 2CB, 2CI, 2CE. Um, and they have various effects, um, uh, wide ranging. And there's others called N2M bomb or 2N bomb, I believe it's what it's called. Um, and it's basically like a um, alternative to LSD, but it's not quite the same and has some dangerous effects. So uh, quite a bit out there. So I definitely recommend people, um, you know, ask around and do their own research because it, it's become quite an expansive field of what's out there. Hey, thanks for that great overview. Do other folks want to share a little bit about the other types of psychedelics? How long do the effects last? some knowledge about some ancient uses, contemporary uses? Uh, I'd be happy to jump in uh, to speak a little bit about MDMA. And I've gone on my own personally healing experience through MDMA through a ceremonial lens. And so the MDMA is notoriously known as the club party drug for its recreational use. Uh, straight out of Wikipedia, MDMA is a psychoactive antiphetamine, also known um, as ecstasy or molly that carries effects such as altered sensations, increased energy, empathy, as well as pleasure. And the effects can last up to three to six hours. Um, but outside of the recreational use and the cultural use of what it is understood to be, uh, what everyone uses it for right now, um, it's currently being researched for a cure for PTSD. And uh, it's been very effective in my own um, healing for PTSD. 
And uh, just one quick fact about it is throughout this research, which is now in phase three of the clinical trials for FDA approval, um, is that 68% of patients reported zero signs of PTSD after 12 months follow-up. And that is very significant, uh, given that the treatments for PTSD um, is, not, is not really good. If you have PTSD, it's, uh, it's not something that, it's, it's just really hard to deal with, and there's not like a cure all for this. So it's, um, it's, it's really nice that this is coming into fruition, and, uh, and it's going to happen in uh, my lifetime. So, Yes, that is exciting. And I know that, you know, MDMA is not always considered a classical psychedelic, but like Danny said, there's all types of things out there, especially nowadays. Um, and, you know, it's also interesting because a lot of people debate whether or not cannabis is an entheogen or a psychedelic. And um, Lorraine, I know you, you have some experience with using cannabis for like um, mental and spiritual purposes. Can you say more about that? Yeah, so cannabis is a plant, uh, the species cannabis sativa, cannabis sativa, that has like high THC, which is a cannabinoid, and has like psychedelic effects for some people. And like THC is not found like in high amounts in hemp, and it's not uh, like the traditional like Western medicine uh, that they say that used for like cure cancer, like and seizure and and then this is the other can. Uh, cannabinoid, the CBD, but the but the cannabis plants with like high THC they can use for psychedelics purpose and like the plants traditionally from Central Asia, and but it has been like spread like worldwide and there's like a like a pentological uh, findings uh, like Africa, America, like Korea, Greece, and they use the herb for uh, in ceremonies for religious purpose and also just for chill. And nowadays, especially in the United States, uh, the recreational legalization in 11 states uh, boosts the economy in like different forms of use. Uh, and there's also like intensive genetic improvement. So there's like a cross combination of, uh, of strains. So they, you can have like plants with like high THC or high CBD concentration, uh, like growing them like in ideal conditionals, like, if, like, uh, like temperature, humidity, nutrients, and then, the common forms to use are uh, smoking the flower that has like the high concentration you can smoke like through a joint or pipe vaping and has like an instant effect and lasts for like a couple hours. There's also dabs that have like stronger concentration and also instant effects. Uh, edibles that have like a longer effect and can uh, provide like psychedelic trips in higher dosage and oils that are good for microdosing and they avoid the harms of smoking. And even like on, uh, for cooking, like infused meals with uh, the leaves, uh, the flowers, so you can use the whole plant. I definitely feel like I'm mildly tripping when I get high sometimes. Definitely. <laughs> I've definitely had moments like that for sure, for sure. And speaking of tripping, you know, my, my psychedelic of choice is always mushrooms because it's so simple, it's so easy to do, um, and there's so many ways to take it. So, yeah, I, I want, I'm wondering if folks, if someone here wants to say a little bit about my drug of choice, mushrooms. Sure. Um, yes, I can share a little bit about um, psychedelic mushrooms. Um, and I think maybe to contextualize, like mushrooms or fungi, they are no considered to be the first multicellular organism on planet Earth. Um, they're considered to be both like an animal and a plant, and they are genetically um, very similar to humans and other mammals. And so when it comes to psychedelic mushrooms, because I'm sure some people like, you know, eat white mushrooms or portobellos or fancy kinds, you know, from, <laughs> from different restaurants, but um, there's types of mushrooms that are psychedelic. Um, and there's actually a pretty big, I think that there's a pretty interesting variety of them. And these mushrooms have psilocybin or psilocin. I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but um, this is a substance that when it is consumed by somebody or ingested, um, it takes a person on a trip, you know, where they experience um, a lot of different things, whether it's like seeing 
you know, patterns or images or moving images of different things that might be in their um, subconscious. Um, and it, it really depends on the person, you know, um, but those are mushrooms um, in terms of their history. Um, there's a lot of evidence that there's, or there's some of the evidence that psychedelic mushrooms are found all over the planet from like, I believe like Algeria, there's like cave paintings of a figure that looks like they're holding a bunch of mushrooms to even um, Mexico. And when I first um, had my experience with psychedelic mushrooms, it was one of my friends who taught me about Maria Sabina, who was an indigenous woman in Mex Mexico where, um, you know, she introduced a lot of white people from America to mushrooms. And um, I think a lot of like cultural appropriation and, uh, um, and other colonial behaviors were happening to her. So I encourage people to look her up because um, I feel like there, there is a very, there's many important histories to know about psychedelic mushrooms um, if anybody is to engage with them. And the effects last four to six hours. Awesome. Yes, thank you. That was great. Uh, and you're right. They they have psilocybin and psilocin in them. So it's like both of those compounds together. Um, yeah, so I, I really appreciate that. And, you know, now that we have all these psychedelics laid out, we know how they, you know, the different ways of doing them, the different types what kind of problems can psychedelics help with? Like, why do people use psychedelics for, to deal with their problems? So I think it was already said that psychedelics um, like Ibogaine and others can help with substance use addiction, including that to opioids or heroin. Um, some people might be using psychedelics to help them heal from like PTSD, as Azo was talking about, CPTSD as well, anxiety, depression, um, feeling stuck in behaviors that are not helping them, or just feeling like they don't have a connection between the mind, body, and or spirit, depending on their belief system. And I think that for me, when I was a little kid going through DARE, um, I didn't really believe the propaganda that the program was teaching me. Um, and I innately thought that, you know what, like this thing, mushrooms, they're probably help helpful. And so I had an idea that they're not like this bad thing that's going to kill you. So as an adult, I um, have used psychedelics to help me heal um, from a lot of my own um, childhood traumas and then coping mechanisms that I developed. Um, and depending on how I did my preparation for these um, experiences, I ha I've had mostly very um, transformative experiences with them. Uh, for me, I, uh, I, same thing with me with the mushrooms. Um, you know, they've helped me heal um, from a lot of bad, uh, not bad, but difficult thinking patterns. Um, but, um, the other drug that I like to take that's helped me a lot recently in the past few years has been LSD. Um, LSD usually lasts longer than mushrooms, about eight to 12 hours. And the mechanisms um, that are triggered in your brain from LSD is different from the mushrooms. They're similar, but they're different. Um, but um, for me, LSD has helped me be able to um, open up space and create space to feel joy and happiness. And um, even though I know it's, um, you know, I'm having these feelings, this experience because a uh, drug is um, uh, coursing through my body and triggering biological mechanisms making me feel this way. But it's deeper than that. It's um, because the effects go beyond than just the trip, especially if I set the intention for it beforehand, like I am taking this you know, for joy or thankfulness kind of thing and have like sort of a mantra to come back to. Uh, the effects last way beyond the initial trip. And so it's not just a biological thing. I think it takes you through um, a psychological and spiritual change for that as well. Um, and for me, one of my favorite activities to do on acid actually is snowboarding. And I know that might sound like really dangerous to a lot of people, but um, I'm really good at snowboarding. And I've gotten actually really good about um, 
managing my trips whenever I'm uh, I'm tripping. And I know what, I'm sure we're gonna come to the discussion of public access and testing and having safe drugs later in this conversation, but you know, my drugs are tested, I know what I'm taking, I know how I feel on them kind of thing, and I don't, and I go low and go slow, which I think we'll talk about later as well. But it almost becomes like a moving meditation because I am focused on the snowboarding, like I am my snowboard, I am the snow and just, just the beauty of it and it just helps create the space within me of like peace like as if that part of nature of being out in the snow and the quietude is like internalized you know we internalize so much it feels nice to actually internalize something beautiful and nice for once so um and i think that's what acid has helped me be able to do and again you know I, I, i'm experienced and knowledgeable about both experiences and so that's how i was able uh, to combine both of them and be able to have basically it's like therapy and church at the same time for me. Yes, I love that. Therapy and church at the same time. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, as I wanted to hear from you, you mentioned um, earlier that, you know, you've had experiences with MDMA and we talked about how that's it's not always considered a classical psychedelic or whatever. So um, can you say a little bit more about your experience you know, using using MDMA, you mentioned that it helped you deal with some like uh, hard experiences of yours. Absolutely. Um, I'm so glad you asked. This has kind of been the point of topic since I've been going through my own journey in such a short amount of time. And I, I continue just to explore it in such a way. So I specifically related to the, um, the healing aspects of MDMA that I've experienced uh, when I started using it in the, the way that it worked for me uh, was I was fortunate enough to find someone to facilitate uh, MDMA therapy session. Uh, but not only was it an MDMA therapy session, uh, it was coming at from a, a lens with a cultural perspective on it, uh, meaning that there was a ceremonial aspect towards the whole therapy session. And so this retooled the experience um, into something that was not just only about like the brain, body, biology, uh, but more of the soul and spirit uh, setting the intention. And that helped me connect the dots on uh, many, many other levels outside of the, the, physical, uh, the physical for me. And so uh, I was fortunate enough to get um, to come across someone that was uh, with a lot of experience from an anthropological, anthropol, I can't pronounce it, but he's got anthropology uh, study and he studies indigenous cultures. And I was fortunate enough to have him bring his experience into uh, these therapy sessions. And uh, he wanted me to help guide my own spirit, uh, so to say. And so I come from a, a Muslim background with the Islamic upbringing. I'm not super conservative or anything, but I'm a child of immigrants. And I, so my, my parents have their own uh, flavor of growing up with it, but essentially my, my grandma raised me. And so that was my strict pillar to Islam. And so she couldn't speak English and she would always pray and, um, my my particular upbringing is very unique because uh, I'm like half Shia, half Sunni, and so my grandma was Shia, but I grew up uh, Sunni, and um, just seeing her like have such a, such a way about her through her existence when when she was raising me, just like it's instilled in me today. And so uh, when I was going through this whole healing ceremony part, I there was three different sessions and uh, each session got progressively more and more as I got deeper and deeper into my own healing of uh, uh, intention setting and uh, there's there's a number of ways that I was setting my own attention and um, every every time would be a, a breakthrough if you break through through the actual ceremony and then break through in between the ceremonies so it's just like explosive uh, but it was a transformation uh, but to speak speak to it a little bit more directly is that like before the actual ceremony session would be uh, the second session I did was we actually did a Sufi column 
Um, and we like I sung Allahu by Nasr Fateh Ali Khan and I talked about how beautiful this song is, this 20 minute song about this man proclaiming his love for Allah and uh, just discovering that whole aspect of music uh, for myself and then be able to place it into my own healing ceremony and then have it reinvigorate my uh, my upbringing just it had a profound effect that I uh, that I'm still riding that wave right now. That sounds beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. That sounds amazing. Thank you. Um, I I really like how you you know really illustrate the cultural aspect and how important that was to you, like relating back to your grandma. So thank you. Um, anyone else want to say anything about how psychedelics have helped them heal or? problems they, they've, they've had solved with the use of psychedelics? Yeah, for me, uh, it also helps me to like seek my spirituality, like on meditation and like to think in a like mindful way and also for healing. So like connecting with my spirituality, I feel like more relaxed, I feel more calm. For meditation, it helps me to think out of the box, and like find solution for persistent like problems on like of the routine and and for healing it uh, helps me to avoid uh, like depression thoughts and behaviors and the way that I use I do uh, like regular micro micro dosing with cannabis that helps me like to cope with my routine and then also reduce the stress. And like with the microdosing, I don't feel like the stoner feeling every day, but I know that like higher doses and it's like the, uh, they're good for intense uh, spiritual connection and just for like recreation. So I feel that without psychedelics, it's kind of like washing your hands on spirituality or happiness, but with psychedelics, you're kind of like taking a shower on happiness and spirituality. Yes, I love that metaphor that you use. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's been really, you know, great to hear everyone like reflect on how psychedelics has helped them. And it really shows how everyone's experience is really unique and different. Um, but I want to kind of backtrack a little bit. So, you know, we're all here, we're talking about using psychedelics in an intentional way and these very serious ways, but I, I want to hear about when did y'all first actually learn about psychedelics? I know a lot of people, you know, they get into psychedelics because they are desperate and they don't know where to turn anymore. And they're in so much pain that they, they want to try anything, right? But that's not the case for everyone. Um, me, I learned about psychedelics through my mom when I was like 14 because I was doing a project on the 60s and 70s music. And I wanted to know like, what are these hippies doing? And she told me that she did acid back in the 70s and used to ride bikes while on acid. <laughs> uh, that said, I was still not really interested in psychedelics, you know, up until I was, I was one of those people who, you know, was desperate and was in so much pain and I needed something um, to help me. But I know that's, that, that's not everyone's experience. So I, I would love to hear from folks who, you know, had had a different experience getting into psychedelics. What did you learn from that experience? Like who introduced you and how did you go about deciding that I'm, I'm gonna do this? I think when I was like, maybe like seven years old or something, my stepdad was talking to me and he was telling me about a plant in India called Bathura, which I think in America is known as like gymsum weed or like moonflower. It's like a white flower. It's really cool looking. And so my dad, my stepdad was telling me that like, oh yeah. And he, he, he was very comical, com comedical, whatever, when he said it, but he was just like, yeah, Krupa, this plant is so beautiful. Like I, it's associated with Shiva and that's why we plant it in our house. And then my dad also, added on and said like oh yeah Krupa you know that people use this plant to reach like deep spiritual understandings and he in particular said that like 
holy people in India use it. And he said, but you know, Krupa, I don't want you to use it because you might go crazy. But I'm just letting you know, this plant will take people places. <laughs> and so that was my first understanding of a psychedelic. Um, I grew up in a family that comes from an agricultural background. Um, so talking about plants and animals is like very, very, very common. Um, but I think the first, and you know, I mentioned that in D.A.R.E. they talked about psychedelics. You know, I wasn't really buying some of the ID conclusions that they were putting out there. But the first time that I did do psychedelics was when um, one of my friends was talking to me about the history of psilocybin mushrooms and Maria Sabina. And then like shortly after one of my other friends told me that he had um, some mushrooms and if he, if I wanted to take it with them. So um, yeah, it was just with my friends and I knew that I wanted to do psychedelics as a kid, but I told myself that I only wanted to do psychedelics when I met people who made me feel safe, you know, enough for me to do it. Um, people like I could trust, you know, like I, I think that as like a woman, I've always had a fear of like sexual assault. And so also just like dealing with like racism from white people. And so for me, I wanted to wait until I found people that made me feel safe enough. Yeah, it sounds like that intuition was guiding you to wait until the right moment to embark on your journey. Yeah. I, I can share a little bit of mine. Uh, mine starting out wasn't as favorable and it kind of led me on a, on a journey uh, since then. And uh, I guess that's just like the path that happens for me. And uh, it's something that like I'm learning to understand its impact and what it means. Uh, but originally growing up in the suburbs of, outside of the city of Chicago um, in a white suburbia um, and then not feeling connected uh, has led me to ways of uh, identifying with people that I don't identify with now. And so uh, when I first heard about psychedelics, I heard about it through the D.A.R.E. program, I, I'm pretty sure. And then I uh, didn't start exploring it until I started, uh, I, I, I started just being on, on a path that I wasn't super proud of. Um, and it was leading to, it was an addictive behavior type of path. Uh, but some of the beginning moments of that was first getting into college and uh, finding like a group of friends, uh, not particularly a lot of people of color in that group of friends, um, but really excited just to uh, have someone that has experienced like LSD and have them talk about like all these inspirational things that they experienced through LSD. And then I, uh, first year out of college, uh, state school, university, um, in the middle of the boons, um, really excited to be in a party atmosphere. And so uh, partaking in all the pleasures of hedonism, basically, and uh, essentially hearing about the LSD uh, from uh, someone's actual firsthand experience um, in that atmosphere with uh, all the friends, uh, we all decided to take it together and um, it was it was very beautiful to to go through that route through that journey, um, and it was so beautiful that uh, I wanted to do it a lot more, um, and so that didn't have a lot of attention into that, um, and so it was kind of like a, something that I, I wish I was lucky enough to come across a resource or someone I trusted to be able to helped me understand what I was going through at the time, but the path that I took from that um, led me to where I am today. And so I, that's why I'm just, I'm just trying to say that like, uh, I wish it, it would have been really nice to like connect with people uh, to feel safe to do it with. Uh, but at the time I didn't understand those boundaries for myself. And so I was taking it with the people uh, that I, I wouldn't be taking with now. Yeah, I definitely hear that. I definitely hear that. And that kind of touches on what I wanted to get into next, um, in, intention, but also, you know, what, if you could go back to your younger self, um, what's something that you wish someone taught you about psychedelics before you embarked on your journey? And what you're, you're messing with stuff that's very powerful, 
very powerful. And so you want to make sure that you treat it with as much respect as you can understand to give it. Um, and just someone talking to me in that tone as if they went through that experience probably would have scared me in the right way. Um, I would, I think um, Danny touched upon this a few minutes ago, um, but I would, I would go through, I would ask myself, my younger self, some questions. Um, for example, I think that if somebody has any pre-existing conditions, um, such as mental health stuff, everything from depression to schizophrenia, they should be aware of it, um, especially if they're also taking any types of medications for any issue that they might have. Um, some psychedelics do not fare well with certain prescription drugs or even other substances um, like cocaine or alcohol, etc. So I would definitely tell my younger self to understand what drug interactions are. Um, and there are some really great harm reduction websites out there that talk more about drug interactions with um, substances, psychedelics. Um, I don't know of many off my hand, but I think a simple Google search pops up some of them. And I know that for me, like, honestly, like these days when I'm looking up facts about substances, I don't just look at the U.S. sources, but I also go and look at Canadian sources, Australian sources, um, you know, your some European sources. So basically I fact checked <laughs> um, what American websites are saying about drugs with other organizations around the world, because I think that some countries have a better understanding about drugs and why people use them. So I really wanna make sure that I'm not like falling into fear-based messaging that might be blowing certain things big when blowing it up or exaggerating certain things in a certain way. Um, so in, in addition to that, I think that people should also look into the history of the substance that they're using um, as well. Um, also the politics of it. Um, I do think that for people who are um, not, I think that, it, you know, for example, ayahuasca, um, you know, there's a lot of issues with cultural appropriation and the continued theft, theft of cultural and medicinal technologies from various indigenous peoples. And so I think people should really research if it is in their place to use a certain substance. Um, same thing with even peyote. I think peyote is, all, you're only allowed to use it if you're part of the Native, Native American church. And I think that has to be federally recognized. So I do think diving into the history is very important so that we are not acting in colonial ways. And I think that when I say this, it's not just like a warning to like white people, but it's also a warning to other advice to other people of color. Um, especially because as a South Asian, I come, you know, I'm a Patel, I come from a Savarna group, meaning upper caste, and my community historically and contemporarily it has been you has caused a lot of violence to people who are um, not of our community. So I don't think all people of color are the same. But yeah, if anybody else wants to add on other points, feel free to do so. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that you brought up cultural appropriation because that's been a big topic, um, you know, in, this, in the psychedelic space, especially with some of the things that have been going on in South America, um, a lot of violence, a lot of, like you said, cultural theft and appropriation. So, yeah, thank you for raising that because a lot of people shy away from that topic and we really have to confront that. And even, even as people of color, you know, like we, you, you can't just move around like a colonizer, <laughs> like you said. So thank you. Did um, other folks want to jump in and, you know, give some, give some advice to your younger self about uh, <laughs> psychedelics? Uh, well, my younger self knew this already, but I recommend people check out arrowid.com. Uh, it has a, it's a really great site that's crowdsourced a lot of like the science behind uh, any drug that you're really interested in. Um, it has some history of each drug in there as well. 
um, but mostly it has a collection of stories and reports written by people um, on whatever drug you want to look up on there. Um, some are super detailed, like some of these people write down the amount they took, when they took it, uh, you know, writing down thoughts and at what time those thoughts occurred or that experience occurred during the trip kind of thing. Some are, you know, more poetic or prose kind of thing. So great way to look it up. You can look up stories by keyword too. So you're like, you know, that's how I got comfortable with snowboarding and tripping was because I Googled or not Googled, but I went on there and typed in LSD and, and uh, snowboarding and found stories by people who talked about their experiences, both good and bad. And sometimes reading the difficult stories, they categorize them like that. Sometimes reading the stories about difficult trips actually make you feel better because you see what led to that difficult part of the trip. And then you also saw the good that they got out of that as well, or the lessons learned too. And so it makes you feel secure in that and also helps prevent bad trips from happening down the road because you feel more secure and less anxious about it going into it. Yeah, I love Arrowhead as a resource. They have a wealth of information on there. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and they've been around for so long too. Um, so yeah, I, I, I agree with what everyone's saying, you know, as I mentioned that these are really powerful substances and they are really powerful. Um, so setting up your intention and doing your research is going to save you, you know, a lot of time in the long run because you're not dealing with, you know, external forces that are making your experience more difficult than it needs to be. Um, yeah, so moving on, you know, we, we talked a lot about how these things can help, the different ways, you know, some people brought up ceremonies, doing it with friends, but, you know, right now we're in the middle of a pandemic, right? <laughs> and a lot of us are alone. A lot of us don't have access to our friends. Um, and even before the pandemic happened, you know, we have a pretty flawed medical system here in the US um, where it's, it's very financially inaccessible. Um, so, you know, what do you tell folks who don't have access to a mental health counselor, um, who don't have access to a community where there are ceremonies going down? Um, how, do, how do you suggest that they go about, you know, journeying with psychedelics in an intentional healing way? I'd say develop a meditative practice, you know, that's accessible to anybody. Um, well, most people, I should say. Um, but, um, it, you know, it's accessible to you, yourself. You don't have to go to a doctor or go to a clinic or pay anybody or anything like that. Um, I can't tell you from the top of my head any good resources online to do that. But, um, yeah, just developing good meditative practice and what goes into that. Um, and I think that will help um, in preparing one for whatever psychedelic journey you want to go on. Yeah. Yeah. I would say meditation and breath work are like the closest you can get to a psychedelic experience without actually taking any substance. So I definitely agree with you on that. I also feel like people should um, do drug testing. Um, so fentanyl, um, a substance that is responsible for a lot of opioid related overdoses is found, has been found in even LSD. And so, um, if you're not already familiar, there's, um, fentanyl testing strips that, um, one can get from harm reduction, substance use recovery organizations that, um, Will, will help you test at home if the substance has fentanyl or not. And then in addition, there's also Narcan or Naloxone, um, this nasal spray or auto injector, injectable that um, delivers Naloxone, something that reverses um, an overdose. So in the case that you might be taking LSD um, and somebody might have put fentanyl in it, you have this resource um, available. And I know that with me, I keep um, a couple doses of Narcan in my pantry. Um, well, not my closet, but I definitely keep it available in case me or anybody else who comes to my house needs it because I feel like I've, yeah, but again, Corona's happening, so nobody's coming to my house. 
<laughs> so I think that's, yeah. But so with that said, if you don't know where to get Narcan or um, fentanyl testing strips, um, there is a website called naloxone for all org and if you go to it it lists um places that are providing naloxone across the country for free so you can look into that and chances are if, per, if the organization is providing nar narcan they probably are also providing fentanyl testing strips um, and these days because of corona some organizations such as live for lolly in the suburbs of chicago they have a mobile van that actually goes around and delivers um, supplies like Narcan to people who are stuck at home who are using substances. So um, I think that there are some ways in which organizations are adapting to getting this medication into people's hands, considering the circumstances we're in. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for naming those groups because, yeah, there are a ton of groups out there, um, Dance Safe, Harm Reduction Coalition, they're all still, even with the pandemic, still making sure that people have safe supplies to um, be able to live and, you know, use, use safely. So, yeah. Um, and yeah, I definitely, I definitely want to get into the harm reduction part a little bit later. Um, but does anyone else want to add on comments before I move on about what are some tips for folks who are alone, don't really have access to a therapist, um, what are, are there any tips for them to use psychedelics in a healing way? I think uh, one resource that you can intentionally use would be a friend. And so if you're really seeking out healing and you really want to facilitate something for yourself, um, you can find out how to incorporate your friend into that, uh, depending on their level of consent. And then uh, having that conversation about how they can help you with that, uh, putting that trust in them in whatever capacity they're willing to. And uh, I think that that can actually be highly impactful. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, and there's so many ways that you can have your friend help you, um, whether it be just a phone call or some type of safety protocol that you're setting up beforehand. So I, that's, that's definitely on the top of my list too, is just depending on your friends and someone you definitely trust and feel safe with. Um, so we, we've been touching um, on harm reduction a lot. Uh, Krupa mentioned the fentanyl testing strips, Narcan, um, Azar, you mentioned friends, uh, Danny, you mentioned start low, go slow. <laughs> um, are there other harm reduction methods out there that folks want to share? Or um, are there any experiences where harm reduction has come in, come in handy for you personally? Yeah, the less white people, the less harm. <laughs> yes, I, I, I totally, totally agree. I totally agree, 100%. <laughs> but Dave, do you want to share more about why that is for you personally? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I mean, when you're on psychedelics, your, your mind's out there. You know, it's like we were talking about, they're powerful, they're powerful things are impacting your mind and your spirit. And um, I just find that why people are so insufferable when they're on psychedelics, because they automatically go to the space of, we're all human, we're all getting along, blah, blah, blah. And it's like they completely skip the part where it's like, sure, but there's still a lot of healing and reparations that need to be done before we can get to the space of we're all human and it's all good, bro, you know? <laughs> and, um, and so, when you bring up the topic of race when you're on psychedelics and it doesn't happen all the time you know sometimes you're just there to have a good time but sometimes the it gets deep and it race is part of our lives and most of the people who are going to be watching this their lives too and so it can come up as a topic of conversation and a lot of white folk are very uncomfortable talking about it imagine how uncomfortable they're going to feel when they're in this space, you know, when they just want to have a good time. 
and you know uh, more like in a festival setting you know where um you notice dynamics that are going on in whatever group or setting that you're in that the white people are not noticing and it's impacting you and if you bring it up it's like why are you harshing my mellow bro you know instead of like trying to understand where you're coming from now not all white people are like that i definitely have been very selective with who i am friends with who are white and who i feel comfortable tripping with and knowing that they have my back or will take care of me as something happens but for the most part i find that it, it, it it's heartbreaking at how often you'd be surprised as to um white people's attitude when they're in that space and 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 they're thinking and how much they don't want to come to your space because they're comfortable and they don't want to do it so that's very very real that's very real and i think for a lot of younger folks depending on you know where you are in the world sometimes it's hard hard to realize that you know while you might have white friends they aren't necessarily the safest people to be doing this with right um and then you bring in the layer of, of criminaliz criminalization if i'm a black person doing drugs with white people and the cops come in who are they looking at first they're going to look at my black ass first right so <laughs> uh, there's just so many layers to that and you know that's that's why we have our group our collective because in in the presence of white people whiteness always takes priority over everything over all of our experiences all of our pain um anything that has to do with us is definitely an afterthought so i i definitely <laughs> i agree with you on that seriously because also we ha we carry a lot of racial trauma with us right so that's that's very real and valid and important and that's important for us to have that space to heal without whiteness impeding on that in any way so yeah thank you for thank you for bringing that up even <laughs> um yeah so moving on if that's all right um i wanted to kind of talk about how psychedelics you know they're being mainstream in a lot of ways we have the medical trials going on we have the psychedelic investors people with millions of dollars who are trying to you know patent psilocybin or whatever <laughs> i don't know if y'all heard about that someone like trademarked psilocybin uh, a few months ago so weird but there's all these people now who are like clamoring to profit from psychedelics and medicalize it, make it official, um, make it a part of our already failing healthcare system. So I want to talk about how um, does this become an issue of access for folks of color? Um, because we know that, you know, MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, they've been doing clinical trials around MDMA for many years, and they're hoping to make MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for people with PTSD a real and legal thing and that sounds great but is will is that something that will be accessible to folks like us um and if not how is that an issue talking about like a uh, criminalization before and and that's I, I feel like that is like the, the like the worst part of uh like the restricted like regulation or like it restricted like a like from enforcement agencies because uh, on the same way that you want like seek like a psychedelic for healing you can also feel anxiety like how to access that like being like a black woman uh coming from brazil i know like i'm a target of criminalization and and also like the lack of information as well so for like the criminalization uh the street, like regulation for enforcement agencies and also the lack of information uh that sometimes are like uh, not like having like safe space, like not getting like tested like uh, psychedelic. So all this, uh, it can also become like a public health issue as well. Yeah, yeah, I like that you mentioned criminalization can create anxiety because even if you do get access to the psychedelics, you know, I've, I've been tripping before in public um, after a big concert and 
I see a big police presence. I remember one time I was like real deep in a, on an acid trip and I saw a black man being arrested in Chicago. And that whole experience just is a reality check for you. You know, you're, you're being reminded like, hey, you might be having fun <laughs> on, the, on acid, but you can get arrested at any second. You know, you could, you could be brutalized by cops in any second. So that's very, very real. Um, but yeah, I wanna hear from other folks. How can, how can uh, the lack of access put us at a disadvantage? Yeah, um, I think one way that I think about it um, is also just like the cost. I feel, you know, um, people don't have a lot of money. And um, I think for me, when I've been in spaces that are like very excited about the MAPS trials and everything, it's cool and all, but in my mind, I'm like, okay, well, how much is this gonna cost? Is my health insurance gonna cover it? If not, what is like, what the remainder I have to pay? And for me, I'm lucky, I have health insurance. You know, I still have a job right now. What about people that like lost their jobs, don't have health insurance, are undocumented? Uh, people who in general don't have money, people who are facing homelessness. And so for me, my, my big thing that comes up in my stomach is like, dang, I feel like people who are white and, and or white adjacent, as well as those who have upper middle class money or middle class money or whatever, they're the ones I feel like might be the ones who can access this medicine easier. And I just think that that's just like extremely racist and classist and casteist, you know, in so many ways. Um, I also just think about cultural competency because um, I think many people want ceremonies, as Uzzah was talking about, that are culturally or spiritually relevant to them. And um, I feel like in my experience, a lot of psychedelic culture, until I met a bunch of POCs like yourselves who are doing it, has this been like a lot of like white people who, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest, like a lot of white people have a very short idea of human history. And they also have many gaps in understanding that psychedelics exist everywhere. Like for example, the continent of Africa has a lot <laughs> of psychedelics, but like nobody talks about Africa. And I think there's a lot of anti-Black racism because the thought of like various Black peoples having psychedelics as a medicinal or fun technology doesn't cross some people's minds because of their under, they're racist ideas. There are a lot of barriers to folks just getting therapy in general because that cultural competen competency isn't there. People don't feel safe. And also, how can you heal with a person whose people cause you that harm that has been in your family for generations, right? Like that is super layered. And yeah, so I, I definitely agree with you on that. I want to circle back to our harm reduction conversation that we were um, touching on, you know, with having a friend, doing research, all that stuff. What about set and setting? People always say set and setting, set and setting. You always hear that in psychedelic spaces. Um, what does that mean, first of all? <laughs> and how, how does it relate to you? Like, how, what does set and setting look like? For you as a as a person of color i mean i would frame it as like uh find a space where you feel comfortable losing your mind in like if you just completely lose it think of a place you know if it's your home or if it's like in nature you know where if just everything just goes bonkers in a good way or a bad way, you know, it could be losing your mind in a good way too. Um, where, what kind of space, what kind of place do you feel comfortable doing that in and just letting go kind of thing? That's usually how I frame like the space and setting question. Uh, I'm gonna chime in with a resource to help contextualize this. Um, and this resource is this book. Consciousness Medicine by Francois Borzat. And it will break up 
Uh, I'll talk about a little bit brief way about setup, but uh, a little bit of background of Francois Borzet is that she was someone that traveled to Mexico and found uh, a, a family that took her in to teach her the ways that their lineage has been practicing ceremonies with mushrooms for 20 years. And uh, that's a very privileged place to be for someone uh, outside that lineage to um, be trained and experience and see uh, and how it's all working and stuff. And so she wrote a whole book about contextualizing what that um, 20 years looks like in terms of what you can do for a ceremonial aspect of preparing uh, for a ceremony and then integrating that ceremony. And uh, she breaks it down into five different aspects with uh, the mind, preparing for the things related to the mind, uh, like journaling, um, writing down your emotions. Uh, she, she'll give you a lot of things to think about uh, for all these, these different aspects. But you can kind of guess stuff for the mind and then for the body, like try to exercise more, uh, prepare your diet, um, and if you like put some thought into it over time, like, you know, that has that placebo effect as well. Uh, but the, the mind, the body, the uh, spirit, um, something with like prayer, something with intention, something that has the meanings, spiritual significance. And then uh, the fourth one was your environment, um, preparing your home, preparing like an altar, uh, putting things together that have spiritual significance that you that you treat as very sacred. Um, she'll give you a, a glimpse of what some of the practices that she has came to understand of bringing that significance into play. And then uh, the last one is your community. Uh, so talking about how you can be like donating to certain charities or help volunteer or help out your friend, your family, or talk to your friends and family about what you're going through. Um, and maybe you can let them know that, you know, I'm going on this big thing uh, that's going to be transfer transformational and uh, please keep me in your thoughts or something. And so preparing for it in that five different ways and then going into the actual ceremony, feeling prepared that you set your setting uh, in as many aspects as you can over a period of time. Uh, so that way, like, you know, in your soul, that you're ready for this this change that you've been waiting for that you're looking to experience and then you go through the ceremony and the ceremony has whatever insights it brings and then the period afterwards is now integrating that ceremony into your everyday which is in my opinion and i think she mentions it too it's more important than the actual ceremony itself uh, because it's the actual change that's going to be the long-term effect. That's the real transformation. And she brings it back home into the five different aspects that you prepare for, for your mind, body, spirit, environment, and community. And can, bringing it, wrapping it all together around, like, you come home from your ceremony and you bring flowers uh, on your, on, in your home, and that's just to show you the new new phase that you're entering in that for the abundance of livelihood that you're looking for and uh, small things like that. So it's a good read. Yeah, I love how you broke that down because a lot of times in set and setting is explained. It's, it's done more in a passive way, just like, oh, just make sure you're in a good place around good people and that's it. But I think it's really important to show that there can be some intention and proactiveness behind that, like creating that space for yourself is like super, super crucial to having um, a good experience and also just getting a lot out of it. And um, like you said, that integration uh, and how that lasts much, uh, how that integration lasts much longer than the actual ceremony itself. I want to get into more of the, back into the kind of the healing, the heavy stuff conversation. Um, you know, a lot of times when we're talking about what kind of problems psychedelics help with, you know, it could be childhood trauma, it could be sexual trauma, it can be, you know, military related, race-based trauma, those kind of things. 
But for those of us <laughs> who have generations of trauma in our in our bloodline, um, sometimes that can come up too in, in psychedelic trips, you know, and it can feel overwhelming because you feel your ancestors' pain um, weighing upon you. So, you know, how, what role do psychedelics play in um, healing ancestral trauma? Uh, I've got a pretty good experience, uh, and so I'd be happy to share. Um, it's definitely a heavy topic for sure, and it took a lot of work to wrap my head around it, let alone heal it. Uh, not or begin to understand what I can do to help repair the wounds that are so deep. Um, and so a little bit of background that I should give is that uh, my my mom, uh, she grew up in East Pakistan. Um, and so she's she was essentially a refugee from East Pakistan. And her mother is a refugee from um, India. And her mother was a refugee from Iran. And so uh, my grandmother was actually a double refugee because she went from India to East Pakistan to the United States. And so uh, just that, that line and just the women on my uh, mom's side uh, is in of itself uh, because my mom experienced uh, atrocity. She saw homes burned down. She saw um, baby like uh, severed. Um, and she's she was separated from her family. She's found uh, she's like reconnected with them in some sense of the way, um, and then she was able to like escape that situation, make it over to Pakistan, and then experience like levels of racism in Pakistan because like she was considered Bihar Bihari, uh, coming from Bangladesh with darker skin tone, and experienced a little racism in Karachi, and then. Um, then like coming to the US after being sponsored uh, from her her brother, uh, her older brother, um, who was then like, she she also experienced like her father passing away at like two years old. And so like my mom is like this survivor. And so I, her story just like, I keep peeling back layers and layers and layers of this story that it's, it's, dumbfounding me that she's still like existing here today um with her spirit and stuff and so uh, um uh to to be able to just speak to that that side that's just like my mom's side my dad's side like he has his own level of history of trauma too from being in Kashmir and like my grandfather lost her lost his firstborn uh through a, a massacre that they don't write about in the history books uh, in Jammu Kashmir called Jammu Massacre. And they they did an ambush um, and they like told them they're gonna take them to Pakistan. My family could have been from Pakistan and I could have been uh, like in a little bit more of a different situation. Um, it, it, but they, they end up losing their first born child in, um, uh, in that ambush. And so that's my dad's oldest sister before he was born and stuff and so that that level of trauma was existing uh, in South Asia at the time. And uh, then they go all the way to the United States as immigrants. And now they're like experiencing like the levels of uh, racism and stuff. And uh, they're also in an arranged marriage and stuff. And so like, it wasn't like a love marriage. So there's like so much complexity to this trauma um, that's like impacting the way that they were uh, understanding themselves and uh, surviving through that. And then then they had kids. And so the cultural context of them having kids when they're not like emotionally ready for that and understanding the significance of what that means for them, um, they, they in a sense have like taken all their experience and placed it into me, into my sister. Um, and we were then raised as uh, children of immigrants in white suburbia. Um, and so like all that had this complexity compounded with all the stuff that happened before I even existed. And so like the, the thing to understand here is like uh, 
to heal it. I just have to understand it. And I'm not even healing it. I'm healing it right now. It's like a daily process. I'm integrating those experiences, but I had to be able to like understand the level of pain that existed. And they growing up shielded me away from that because they, uh, you know, they've survived so much that they wanted me to grow up in this bubble. Uh, because of their unhealthy, uh, they didn't realize at the time, but that was like the way that they decided to raise me. And that uh, was not exactly the, the most ideal way to raise uh, your child to shield them away from uh, humanity. Um, because I wish if I was exposed to some of these concepts earlier, some of this pain, I would probably be aligned a little bit more uh, strongly throughout my upbringing. Um, but I in order for me to wrap my head around all that was I had to go through my own healing process of understanding what happened to me. And then that led to so many more questions of like, all this stuff was happening to me because like all this stuff was happening to my parents and uh, people have their own personal relationship with their parents and stuff. And like, for me, I was able to find forgiveness and mercy for my parents because I was able to peel back the layers and find out what they were going through. And it's not like they chose to be who they wanted to be. They, they did to a certain extent, but like, uh, they still like survived so much. Mm-hmm. And so like, I, it, it just like helped me be able to, uh, ask as many questions as I can and like imagine what they were going through and hold that experience down and, develop the level of empathy in myself that is now growing uh, outside of outside of myself onto not just my family but to everyone and to humanity as a result yeah so I want to follow up and ask you know through your experiences with MDMA how can you describe how it feels when these things come up um, when you're on your journey, like, is it scary? Is it like give you anxiety? Does it like surprise you? Are you like expecting it? Yeah, excellent. Uh, this is very unique uh, to each individual because it determines it's determined on the level of your familiarity with it and how well that you've reacted to it, can react to it. Um, and so, if like these memories will be coming up. Um, the, I'm going to try not to get so deep into it because I look into it a lot, but like MDMA will affect areas in your brain that will like slow down, uh, your default mode network. And so your default mode network, if you're severe, uh, suffering effects of PTSD will be like associated with like negative modes of thinking, meaning that like, you'll be so used to like thinking something so bad all the time. And that's an addictive mindset. Um, so the MDMA will affect the areas in your brain that will slow that part down. And so your, when you're coming up into that addictive mindset, uh, your prefrontal cortex is now activated and the fight or flight response is now slowed down. So you're not acting so much a fight or flight, fight or flight. And now your, uh, logical sense is now more processing where you're going through. So underneath the practitioner that he's able to guide you towards like, well, this memory is coming up um, now that like the body is affected in a certain way and like trauma stored in the body. And so like all these repressed memories start to emerge and uh, you're not like wincing at them. You're not trying to shield yourself away from them. Um, now you're like in a better place to kind of handle them. Not to say that you, you can't handle them off the bat. It takes practice. It's, it's a time thing. Um, and uh, so at first, like you might like wince up or uh, I remember I was asked something so hard that like uh, it felt like it felt like this. It wasn't as intense as this, but it felt like I got hit by like a stun gun and started like shriveling up because I was like, oh, my God, I cannot deal with this memory. This memory is so hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my practitioner like told me to like, you know, just like go with your breath, hold your heart, feel your heart. And like, I I realized I couldn't even like connect with my heart because that's how much I've been disconnected from my heart. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I had to go through like three different sessions and every session, six hours each has been like uh, such a, such a big moments um, up and down all around. And so I, 
it's it's different every time. And uh, when I started to get more comfortable with it, more familiar with it, um, I was feeling more and more prepared to talk about it, more and more prepared to uh, embrace it. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, if you're if if you haven't experienced it before, it's going to hit you like a ton of bricks. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I'm really curious, you know, I, I'm less experienced with MDMA, but I, I have always heard that, like, it makes you a little, um, I, I think you were touching on this when you are talking about, like, the addictive mindset of, like, negativity, um, how MDMA can, like, help do away with that. But I'm also curious, like, how that compares to um, mushrooms. Like, how for anyone else i want to hear from everyone actually um how how have psychedelics played a role in healing ancestral trauma or race-based trauma um we talked about ndma but other folks want to share other experiences with different substances uh, mushrooms you know lsd yeah um i can share um so i so i feel like you know, again, like not all people of color have the same experiences of being racialized. And so to speak to my experiences, um, I, you know, as a child, I like was bullied severely by white boys in particular, um, called a monkey, called a lion, called like other slurs related to being Indian and coming from a Hindu family. And when 9-11 hit, it got even worse. Like I would be cornered at lockers. And, you know, there were some, there was a boy who would ask me like if I was related to Osama bin Laden, if I was gonna marry Saddam Hussein, if I was one gonna be one wife out of seven for some like other person who was famous around that time period. And so those things, plus the fact that I came from a very abusive family with lots of intergenerational trauma really messed me up. I had severely low self-esteem, um, very just I hated myself, could not feel like I had a purpose, could not find anything good about myself. And um, I would say that I went through white supremacy as well as gender-based violence. Um, and so for me, when I have done some psychedelics, uh, mushrooms, um, I guess like and again, th- these things are different for different people. But for me, the, uh, the medicine has helped me reconnect to that, in, to that deep thing, deep, in, deep down inside of me that I think is, that is alive in everything in life, that like I do have a purpose, I am worthy of being here. And it just does what somebody might go through in clinical psychotherapy very quickly. Like I feel like I do I did seven years of clinical psychotherapy in my last psychedelic ceremony that I went through because on the inside, like all these experiences come back and like it just dawns to me that wow, like I'm not as fucked up as I think that I am. I'm a human on a human journey. Like all these, you know, nice things. But I think that for me, this is also complicated by the fact that like, you know, again, I come from a Savarna family. Um, In India, there is a lot of violence against people who are not Savarnas, meaning folks that are quote unquote lower caste or Christian or Muslim or Sikh. And my community, um, upper caste Patels, are known in the state of Gujarat for being um, landlords, politically very powerful and exerting genocides upon people, voting against affirmative action. And so for me, like, I have... I, you know, like, I, I, I can't say that my community, my Patel family and whatnot, that we were oppressed. We were and still are the oppressors of people in South Asia and the diaspora. Um, I know that, like, a lot of folks talk about how slavery is a very, was really prominent in ancient India, and I think to this day still is, um, and a lot of upper caste families are the reasons why that exists. Mm -hmm. So I feel like for me, when I do psychedelics, I like to do psychedelics with other people that are aware of these histories. Um, I also feel like, yeah, like I guess like for me, I can't, I, I can't, 
yeah, I feel like I feel like I'm in a diff different position than maybe other people of color are. I do want to say though that I really think you know there's some people who are like, yeah, I did a bunch of psychedelics. Now I'm like super spiritual. Like life is amazing, and I'm very <laughs> happy for them. But I really think that like for me, the personal is political and is also spiritual. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I'm not one of those people that is just like, yeah, like I'm, I just got this deep idea. Like everything's Gucci, like whatevs. That's not me. I really urge people to like politicize their experiences. And when I said, I think I said a few seconds, seconds ago, who would I do psychedelics with? I want to do psychedelics with other people that also understand that the spiritual is political and personal. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a little bit about my thoughts about confronting race, um, intergenerational trauma and psychedelics. Yeah. Yeah, I really, I really like that you showed that you're in a unique place, you know, having that racialized experience here in America, especially post 9-11, but also recognizing that, you know, in in your family's home country that y'all have had the position of the oppressor right and that's a difficult position to be in it's not easy to acknowledge but you know like you said you just don't take a bunch of psychedelics and you're like oh it's like i'm enlightened as fuck now you know <laughs> it's a it's a continual process of working to unpack these things and working to unpack um the experiences of our people and our ancestors. So, yeah, I, I think you touched on a lot of great things. And for me particularly, I was also thinking about how, um, I think I, both of y'all made me think of compassion and forgiveness and how those have come up for me in terms of um, confronting racial trauma and intergenerational trauma in my family. Um, because, you know, my, my father was incarcerated and was deported when I was younger. And, you know, f because of that experience, I carried a lot of shame and anger towards my dad, but also the entire system in and of itself, right? And for me, when I'm reminded of that on a mushroom trip, I find myself having more compassion and forgiveness towards my parents because at the end of the day, they're people too with their own experiences, right? And they, like, I think as I was saying, like, when our parents created us, they also put all of those experiences onto us, not in, intentionally, but it's just an inherent thing that happens. So, you know, finding that compassion, not only for yourself, but for other people around you sometimes is is really necessary and being able to forgive people for things that they'll never apologize for right so yeah i i think this i really love everything that y'all said does anyone else want to add how psychedelics have helped them you know confront racial trauma or ancestral trauma I grew up in Brazil and I was always like curious about psychedelics, especially cannabis. Uh, but I, uh, I had like hard access. So because of like criminalization, being a black woman, I was like, feel was a target. So I didn't like feel safe, uh, like buying on the streets. And I like my access was mostly with friends, but I had like a lot of like traumas and anxieties and fear. Uh, like Brazil is a country that is like very diverse, uh, but the, but there's like the whiteness is seen as like a role model and then it's enforced by popular culture and black bodies are objectified as like a sexual, uh, for sexual satisfaction, uh, which like gave me like a problem, like to accept myself, to like build like relation, uh, romantic relationships and like to speak out about my feelings. So. Uh, a way that I feel like to uh, like deal with that was uh, through alcohol. And in my family, there is a lot of alcohol abuse. Uh, like I have like relatives that have like disease and they're like dying associated to alcohol. And like I was taking alcohol like to like treat like my trauma, but I was also like afraid uh, to, and I end up like suffering with like alcohol abuse uh, I, I like, I was uh, diagnosed with like high blood pressure in a very young age, like less than, uh, like less than 30 years old. And I still like take medicine for high blood pressure. Uh, also like, uh, obesity. 
So, but when I moved to, to the United States uh, and to Portland, uh, I had a, like a better access to cannabis and this helped me a lot to reduce like my alcohol use. Uh, to accept my identity and then like to feel that I deserve love, that I deserve respect and love myself, like love myself as a big black, black woman, accepting myself the way that I am. And, and also like, but also like li living here was also, uh, was like good that I had like access uh, for cannabis as a healing uh, psychedelic, but on the same way I was dealing with like new, uh, like new issues I was uh, far from my family and that makes me feel like a little depressed. And for a long time, cannabis also helped me with like motivation. I just could like, like leave my bed after smoking right in the morning. But that was like what had like to face my day and kind of like to uh, like dissociate with like the the, the depressed reality I was living. And then like to forget like the, the imposed like norms by the society to not feel anxious about the social norms and uh, and then and other like behavior, like uh, white patterns that kind of oppress like communities of color. Thank you for sharing that. And I've had that same experience with cannabis too. Like that's my go-to every day as well because um, it just makes all of, like you said, the pressure from social norms, anxiety and stuff, it just makes all that kind of melt away. And I think I heard like one time on this TV show, um, someone was like, oh, you can we makes you like not care about anything. And someone was like, no, we makes you care about the shit that matters and say, fuck you to everything else that doesn't matter. <laughs> so that's, that's why I, I totally agree with you on that. It's, it, melts away all of that other extra stuff, you know. Um, I wanted to kind of continue a little bit with the whole an ancestral concept we're talking about. Have any of you ever been visited by an ancestor while journeying or um, like felt a presence or, or, or something like that? And what was that like for you? And, and did you like, yeah, what did you take from it? Uh, I can go ahead and share mine. Um, I've been visited by uh, definitely some ancestors. Uh, one ancestor that I'll speak to is uh, my mom's father, uh, who, like, passed away. And it was someone that I've never met and someone that my mom barely knows. And... Uh, the way that he came and visited me was with him, like, I, like, I kind of got a sense of his facial uh, expressions and, like, what he was walking throughout the day and, like, some of the frustrations that he was dealing with uh, in a very, like, small, like, glimpse of, like, you know, his, him wearing clothes and, like, being out in the day, like, owning businesses and stuff and, uh, pushing up his glasses in a certain way and um and I think that was just like him just trying to say like you know like you think about me and this is like oh this is what I was like um but then also he kind of like I I got another experience where I feel like I saw the moments before he passed away uh where he like dropped something on on a desk and um then he like lost uh his like footing and um, he passed away from like some uh, disease, I believe, some heart disease, but like moments before he like fell to the ground and stuff. And uh, I think that was just him just like acknowledging my respect that I was shouting out to him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And was that comforting for you or was it like kind of weird or? I, it was wholesome. <laughs> It was wholesome because the the whole things I was going through uh, for those ceremonies, I was putting a lot of emphasis on everything, and so I, I I found it a blessing to go through any of that experience and to associate it back with him. I was very grateful for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I've had 
experiences similar to that um, with mushrooms, particularly at the beginning of my trip, because, you know, if I take a, like a dose, like three and a half grams, I, I said this before, I always vomit or I tend to vomit. And it's weird because when that's about to happen, I feel like I'm being visited by an ancestor that's telling me like, it's going to be okay. Like, I know you're freaking out right now, but it's going to be all right. And one time I remember getting a vision of a woman who um, I assumed was in Cuba because that's where some of my family is from. And she was like speaking in Spanish. I couldn't really understand what she was saying, but she was kind of laughing at me too. Um, like and I, as I was hugging the toilet. <laughs> um, and you know, in a way, it kind of made me feel comforted because I'm like, okay, well, she's laughing at me, so I'm not going to die at least. So <laughs> I'll be all right. She, she's, she's having a good time. I'm going to have a good time. So yeah, I, I, <laughs> I always love like being comforted in those difficult moments. And you're, you're being reminded that, you know, while it may seem like you're walking on this plane alone as a human being, there's always people or presences, presence, a presence surrounding you that's, you know, can be guiding you or, or protecting you. Anyone else want to say something about their ancestors visiting them while journeying? Yes. <laughs> um, I'll say, um, that when I had first started using marijuana, um, I would have often a lot of moments where I felt like I was bad. I was in, dif I was somewhere else. So one memory that I have is, you know, I was at a party hanging out with some people and I was smoking some weed. And <laughs> um, I literally felt like I was in colonial India. And I started seeing <laughs> like all these figures and people in the streets. And I was just like telling my friends, I'm like, guys, like, this is what I'm seeing. And they were all like, did you take anything other than weed? Cause that's really weird. I've never heard of that. And so I wanted to say that I think it's really cool that um, Lorena, you and Ifitayo have talked about how marijuana can um, is a psychedelic and is considered to be so in many um, communities, groups, organizations, et cetera, because that gets overlooked a lot. Mm -hmm. I feel like um, when it comes to other substances, when I've been on mushrooms, um, so I feel like, you know, my ancestors are part of my personal belief system is that my ancestors are not just like people, but they're also like plants, animals, trees, ge ge geological stuff like mountains. And um, I often like very, very often the first thing that I will see when I am doing some type of psychedelic is um, spiders. Like I'll immediately see a bunch of spiders and wasps <laughs> and grasshoppers. And I love insects. I really do. And anacrids or whatever spiders are called, I love them. So like every time I see them, I'm just like, damn, like my old friends are here. And <laughs> there is a sense of kinship I feel with them that is just like, beautiful it defies this like colonial logic that we're all forced to live under mm -hmm. and it makes me feel cared for I'm like damn yo all these like grasshoppers and bees and wasps and whatever spiders they care about me they be living in my house you know they <laughs> they're looking after me um you know and, I, and, and in one of my recent experiences I saw instead of seeing a bunch of insects I actually saw deer like many deer and elk running towards me and that was like also a really great affirmation that like I have a connection to them and I do believe that they are an ancestral force that is more ancient than people um because you know humans homo sapiens I feel like we haven't been around as much as we or have not definitely been around as much as like other creatures mm -hmm. and so many of these other creatures have been here before us and so I feel like they are part of my family um, and sometimes it's like hard to like talk about this in spaces that are maybe like white or anti-spirituality or like anti-animal, anti-plant. So, um, I've like always yearned to do psychedelics with people that would understand this part of me because I can't turn it off. Um, similarly that we can't turn off our racial experiences 
when we're taking psychedelics and we want to be around people that will honor what we're going through and what we're witnessing and our truths. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I, I, I feel similarly about, you know, seeing as ancestors as insects, animals, land masses, things like that. I definitely, definitely believe that. All right, so moving on to our last question. Um, it's, I want to kind of leave it open-ended. Uh, a few of you guys mentioned that the effects of, of psychedelics go beyond the trip, right? And I want to talk about integration because a lot of conversations focus on just taking psychedelics recreationally, but we don't, we don't talk about what happens after the trip enough, right? And how sometimes some folks struggle with integrating themselves back in, um, doing the day-to-day -day routines. Uh, so I wanna hear from you guys, what, what does integration look like for you? What are some, um, some tips, some resources you might have around that? Um, I know, you know, we threw out some websites and books earlier, but if there's other resources on integration, I'd love to hear about that. And also, um, yeah, just just some information around how intention can um, connect to integration. I find that journaling helps a lot, um, especially leading up to the trip and then after the trip too. Mm -hmm. That usually helps me out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah is is would you say that's your way of just like processing everything like being able to look at everything you've written on the page is and understanding that yeah i mean it's almost like intention setting when you're writing beforehand and then afterwards basically debriefing yourself and what you went through and your thoughts that kind of thing compared to how you felt before mm -hmm other folks has anyone ever had trouble integrating after um journeying yes for me lots of times <laughs> um i've had a decent number of experiences where i'm just like i'm bored so fuck it i'm gonna take these shrooms and just hang out which is awesome i think that definitely works for many people but for me, it did not work because I would be pro given all these like understandings coming to me and I had no way of like understanding it. I just felt overwhelmed. Um, I also like didn't think about like my setting that I took them in. And so for those experiences, I didn't have much to integrate because I was just like hanging out and seeing some cool stuff, but it just didn't feel as intense as the trips I've done where it's been an intentional ceremony. Mm -hmm. And so I think to be more specific, when I did my last ceremony, me and my facilitators had a long session where we talked about like, what did I learn from this trip? What I want, what changes do I, want to, what do I want to make in my life? And so part of these changes included, like I need to reach out to like certain family members and have difficult conversations. I need to create like an altar. I need to join this like community group. I need to like work on getting some documents completed. So it was a list of like 25 ish things that I wanted to do. And, um, Part of my integration is that um, every other week I talk to my with my facilitator since I had the ceremony to check in with them about my progress on whether or not I made these like life changes mm -hmm. that I wanted to make after I did my psychedelic ceremony. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, for me, it's be after I have done the ceremony, you know, I write down a list of things I want to do to improve my life and then I try to do it. And having a community of people that can be a, hold me accountable is very important. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that they're the facilitators of my psychedelic ceremony is even better because then they have like more intimate knowledge as to like who I am and what I'm trying to do in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, 25 things to do afterwards that sounds like you had your work cut out for you for sure <laughs> but it also shows that you were taking it very seriously and you know we talked about this earlier that these are very powerful substances so you don't want to approach it um just frivolous frivolous frivolously right you want to approach it with some intention and seriousness 
Um, and I, it's, it's really awesome that you had like a support system kind of carrying you through that. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering if other folks want to share about their experiences with integration. Yeah, I, it really depends on where you're coming from. I, because for me, I did not have a good relationship with food and I, it was always difficult for me to take care of myself as a result and did not realize the impact that was happening. I, and then after the first ceremony, I realized that I was, was addicted to so many different things. And when I like identified that piece and like subsided it and really try to have a morning ritual of making myself breakfast so that I can sustain myself, that practice like manifested in so many different things. And uh, the way you're really looking for is like trying to have a transformational practice, trying to have this like new lifestyle that you're looking for. So uh, a big thing for me was not having the relationship with food that now I'm uh, so grateful to uh, pick back up or, or start, just start. Yeah, it's really about building up those good habits again. And well, thank you all for this lively and super important discussion. Um, y'all were all really amazing, and and I look forward to the continuing conversations that we'll have after this. Uh, for our audience, this conversation was brought to you by the People of Color Psychedelic Collective. Make sure you follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and please stay tuned for our live Q&A. All right. Thanks. <laughs>